Mr. Dean, start recording. All right, so we are on air, so to speak. Do we have any questions from Tuesday? Are there any questions from Tuesday, either regarding the lecture material or the lab stuff that we did on Tuesday? Nope. Okay, so you guys are feeling comfortable with Logisim? More or less? The command line stuff? How about the command line stuff? So if you're not comfortable with the command line stuff, you know, um, I would recommend watching a video that is already linked from Canvas. So the video that will show you how to use the command line tool is titled, not surprisingly, video to show how to use CLI, command line interface in Windows and also Linux and Mac OS. Basically, I think I got all three popular operating systems covered. If you're using FreeBSD, you're kind of on your own. But if you are really using FreeBSD, free you have been on your own all along anyway, so you're used to it. Okay, nobody's getting the joke. That's okay. <laughs> because nobody's actually using FreeBSD in this class. Okay, never mind. All right, so what we'll be talking about today is we are finishing up the module that we were talking about on Tuesday, and then we are going to continue with uh, base conversion, which is you know, this you know, module over here. I'm hoping everybody got a chance to read and finish reading the, the module that we were on on Tuesday, and hopefully also have a little bit of time to also to read the module that we are going to move into today. That part is really important, okay? Giving yourself enough time to not only to review the stuff that we talked about, but also to move on a little bit to the stuff that we'll be talking about in lecture is you know, how you know, I would expect people to do in this class. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with, um, you know, go back to your know, physical state, truth, numbers, and computers. <coughs> And I believe last time we have already established that we have NAND implemented by the two N transistor and the, P, the PT transistor. Is that correct? All right, very good. So one quick thing that you can do, you know, I know this is really kind of early in the morning, but you can always you know, go to the video recording and just kind of slide it all the way to the end and watch the last 10 minutes or so of the previous lecture that will help your brain to bring up the context for this class so that by the time you get to school, because you t all you have to do is to give your, your brain the cue, the cues of the lecture material, the, your subconscious will actually help you retrieve all the context and load everything in, so by the time you get to class, you know, your brain is going, okay, I remember everything about the previous class. We're, we're ready to go, okay? All right. So. What we did last time was to talk about the truth table for NAND, where the only time you get an output of zero is when both the inputs are ones. Because one, which is true, true and true is true, but NAND is negated AND. So once you negate that one, you get a zero. So that's the only time you get a zero out of a NAND bit. Is that okay? Is that kind of helping you to kind of recall what we talked about on Tuesday? Excellent. So now we move on to why is NAND a really useful gate? Well, because we can use NAND to do everything. We can use NAND to implement logical knot. This is the mathematical symbol for logical knot, and this is the mathematical symbol of NAND. So I claim that the negation of x is the same thing as x NAND x. Did we talk about this last time? I don't think we got to this part. Okay. So if you think the um, symbols is a little bit confusing because you know, this is the first time we actually use the mathematical symbols, what I'm really talking about is this. Okay, I'm using my uh, notepad here. So what I'm really claiming is the negation of x is really the same thing as the negation of x and x because you know, this whole thing here is x nand x. Are we doing okay so far with that 
portion because that portion that has to do with the definition of NAND, we are not deriving anything, we are not deducing anything, we're just saying how that's just you know, how NAND is defined. So when you look at this, you know, some people can look at this and go like, yep, okay, now I get it. Because x and x is really just x, okay? You know, whatever the value of x is, the conjunction of x with itself is gonna be the same. So the negation of that is just the negation of x. So I'm hoping that you guys are now convinced that this is one way we, we can actually implement the negation, the logical negation of x. So the slide kind of moves on to talk about you know, normal conjunction, and it claims that x and y, this is the mathematical symbol of uh, and, so x and y is the same thing as x and y, and x and y. So what does that boil down to when it comes to you know, just regular C notation? So this is an exercise that, you, that I would do for you this time, but for the next one, I want you guys to kind of do it for yourself, okay, as an exercise. So in this case, you know, the um, x and y, okay, this is normally how we write it in C or C++, and then I translate that to, you know, the NAND notation. So the way we do this is to look at what we have here. And then we start with the outermost operator, in other words, the last operation to perform in the expression. It is a NAND. So I automatically know that I am doing something like this. Because that's a NAND, right? That's the last NAND that I need to operate. So the question now is, from the perspective of this particular NAND operator, what is on the left-hand side and what is on the right-hand side? Well, that turns out to be just x NAND y. So in the parentheses here, now I put down the negation of x, oops, x and y, and the same thing on, in the, uh, on the other side. So I just copy and paste this, copy and paste. So this entire thing on the right-hand side, this portion here, that is the long version of x NAND y NAND x NAND y, but expressed only using the operators that are supported in C++. So is that process understood? Okay, because you know, I'm working on this from a structural perspective. I typically work on the outermost thing and then work myself into the nested portion of something, but some people might like to do it in the opposite way, starting from the nested portion and then work your way out. Whatever you do, as long as it is a consistent process and you're familiar with it, it's fine, okay? So, now the big question is, are we really sure that x and y is really the same thing as x and y and x and y? How do you prove it? Because just because tech claims something does not automatically make it true, okay? So what you need to do is to make a truth table, okay? This is the format of a truth table. Once again, I will give you the template of the truth table, but I want you guys to fill it in so that you have the opportunity to exercise, you know, to practice, you know, this thing. X can be false, X can be true. When X is false, Y can be false or true. When X is true, Y can also be false or true. So we have four rows <coughs> in this truth table, and I want you guys to spend a little bit of your time, remember, for each hour of lecture time, you're supposed to be spending two hours of time after the class, after the lab, so use a little bit of that time to fill it up with your truth table. So fill up this one, that should take you five seconds. And then fill up this part. It will take you a little bit longer, but you know, let's say five minutes, okay, at the most. But that will give you the practice of how to use a truth table, and at the same time, get a better understanding of what NAND really is about, okay? Because you know, it's not one of the operators that we are used to, but nonetheless, it is one of the more important gates in uh, computer engineering. All right, so this is one. <coughs> and then with the next one, which is regular OR, I will leave it up to you to basically do all of the above. So what you need to do is to have a truth table, one column for just uh, x logical OR with y, which is really easy, 
and then another one to translate this into the NAND operation. In other words, what is equivalent to this portion, I want you to, to derive it for this portion over here. The steps are about the same. The result is a little bit different, but the process, I want you guys to kind of go through that process so that you have some experience here working with these operators. Um, if anyone wants me to give, want me to give you the solution, I can do that next Tuesday. So if you work on it, you have a solution, you have an answer, but you're not quite sure whether that really is the case, I can talk about that next Tuesday. There's nothing to turn in. This is not a graded homework assignment. This is just an activity that I suggest that you guys would do so that you can practice all this stuff and let the idea of a NAND gate sink in a little bit more. All right, so that's kind of the suggested activity. So if you're taking notes, okay, you probably can just kind of write down the timestamp because I'm still recording the lecture and just go like, okay, there's some suggested activity and Pat talked about it from 9.10 to about 9.15. So that will give you the kind of the cue of, okay, I just have to fast forward in the recording to about the 10 minute mark and that should be where, you know, where the description of the uh, suggested activity is. All right. So do we have any questions about all of this stuff here? Any questions? All right. What do you think is the relevancy to you, um, considering that we have all this AI stuff going on and NVIDIA being a $3 trillion company now and so on? You know, how does this relate to you? If possible, I, want to, I don't want to teach you something that you will never see or use again and it's, it's of no value to you. I want to relate to things that might actually be of value to you. So why, what, what do you think this has anything to do with you completing your transfer degree, transferring and then getting your bachelor's degree in, in either computer science or computer engineering or electrical engineering? Where, where's the connection? This is one of the things on the list of classes that I have to take. So if I pass this class, I have one fewer barriers to get my degree. That's one way to look at it, okay? But I'm not saying it's wrong, okay? There's nothing wrong with that view. But it's better if you understand how this can actually be applicable. So what I'm going to say is on your cell phone, um, the older cell phones do not have this, but the new, newer cell phones, they typically have a chip called an FPGA. FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Logic. Okay? So you might be saying, so what does it do? I mean, the name is not, doesn't sound very cool. Well, it is kind of cool because it allows you to build circuits like the, build, the one that you build in Logisim but using only logic gates, okay? So you have NAND gates and so on and so forth. But it is reconfigurable at runtime. So that means if you get an update on your phone over the air, it is potentially possible for Samsung, for Motorola, for all of these manufacturers to update a certain chip on your phone so that it can improve the performance of performing certain types of tasks. So you might be asking, what kind of tasks are we talking about? It can be uh, AI related you know, computation because AI related computation can be done using a processor. So your, your AMD or Intel main processor, the CPU, can perform all of those operations. Fine, not a problem. Not efficiently, okay? So do you want to enable the AI assistant on your phone but your battery life will drop to one quarter of what it used to be? Would that be a good product? Probably not, right? But FPGAs can help because an FPGA can basically be reprogrammed to perform certain type of math operation with high efficiency compared to the processor, okay? But it is possible that you know, when Samsung wants to release the S25 you know, cell phone, that they haven't really quite figured out the best way to do it. They figure out a way of doing it, just not the best way. But they have to release the phone because of all the 
advertisements and whatnot, the advertising campaign already said, we're going to release this phone in April. So they cannot just go like, wait, we, we're not done yet. Okay? So they're going to release the phone with a less than optimal programming for the AI type calculation. But once they figure out, oh, this is going to be better. Okay? We, we're going to shave the energy requirements and the battery life of this phone using the AI assistant. It's going to extend by 25%. Okay, so now they can upload, they can um, distribute that update over the air, and then one day your phone just goes like, oh, I used to have to charge my phone in the middle of the day, and it still has 75% of your battery left. That is FPGA, okay? Why FPGAs are cool on mobile devices? Because it can help um, bring updates to improve the efficiency of your phone doing certain things. Okay, so now the question is, then how do we specify the logic in you know, an FPGA? If you know how to use LogiSim, it's kind of like that, okay? Except it's not graphical. It is all using um, a pro protocol programming language. It's either Verilog or VHDL. VHDL stands for something, you know, Hardware Description Language. HDL stands for Hardware Description Language. So it's a, it looks like C, but it's a programming language to help specify how the gates are connected. In other words, we are doing the same thing that we are doing in Logisim, except it's all in text. Is that okay? So that is, um, but everything compiles to the lowest level of constructs on the FPGA. As it turns out, the NAND gate and the NOR gate, N-O-R NOR gate, are the two simplest gates from the perspective of how we use transistors to implement those gates. So that means the F an FPGA is a massive array of either NAND gates or NOR gates. What you're programming is the interconnection between the gates. That is how you know, FPGAs are programmed. So that relates to what we are talking about here because if you want to get into uh, computer engineering in order to you know, kind of write the code for the FPGAs and whatnot, this is the beginning. This is the fundamental of all that stuff. And I think in the near future, you know, most software engineers will also need at least some degree of knowledge of you know, these you know, gate logic because you know, if a software engineer says, okay, we are performing this kind of computation a lot, but the CPU is awfully inefficient with these kind of computation, then you can go like, wait, maybe we can send this kind of computation to the FPGA and have the FPGA to perform all of these specialized you know, computation so that you can offload you know, that kind of computation from the main CPU. So that means you know, it's, I think this is going to be useful. Why is NVIDIA now a three trillion dollar company? In, with a GPU, but the GPU is basically specialized processor. They perform certain types of calculation with extremely high efficiency. And each core is also very small. We did this calculation um, yesterday with my, um, uh, with the same class, but the one on uh, <coughs> Monday and Wednesday. So if you buy a $300 NVIDIA uh, graphics card, how many CUDA cores do you think you have on that card? A CUDA core is a discrete individual computation <coughs> engine that is specialized to perform calculations that are specific to uh, three-dimensional transformations and stuff like that, you know, kind of calculations that games you would need. So give me, give me, give me an estimate. How many CUDA cores is on a $300 um, NVIDIA graphics card, street price. Three thousand five hundred and something. Yes, if you spend three hundred dollars on an Intel or AMD processor, how many cores do you think that would come with? Eight. Okay, six, eight, maybe even twelve. That's it, right? But when you spend the same amount of money on a graphics card, it comes with 3,000 plus cores. 
Each one is highly specialized to perform a certain kind of math calculation. And what do you think AI is all about? Well, at least the AI today, okay? They're all neural net based. And if it's neural net based, it is all based on calculations. It doesn't have to make decisions a whole lot. There's not a whole lot of loops. There's not a whole lot of conditional statements. There's not a whole lot of data structure. But don't tell Iraj about this. <laughs> <laughs> all right? It's all just computation. Massive amount of multiplication and addition. And the CUDA cores are extremely good at this. So that's why, you know, before the AI thing you know, became trendy, in other words, in about 2020-ish, um, the hobbyists were already using their graphics card on their computer to do all the neural net related you know, uh, tasks, like training and so on and so forth. So I know most of you want to become a millionaire, and these days becoming a millionaire is nothing, okay? Because almost everybody is a millionaire living in the Bay Area. If you have a house, you're a millionaire. But it means nothing, because if you move out of the house, where are you gonna go? Every house is at least a million bucks. <laughs> so that, you know, you go, the, the, the value of the house means nothing unless you move to Nebraska. Then you go like, oh, that's a good deal. I'm gonna sell my house in San Francisco and move to a $200,000 house that is really nice with a huge yard in Nebraska. Anyway. Um, getting back to NVIDIA, so, and or AI, what are the two constraints of new startup companies who want to do a lot of cool stuff with AI? Name two constraints. Time. Yeah. Uh, servers. Hmm? Servers. Build load. Okay, so hardware. So yes, you're absolutely correct. NVIDIA is falling behind in production. I'm not sure whether it's intentional or not, because now the her chip price is skyrocketed because everybody wants it, right? What is the second one? Energy. Yep. Energy. Energy, that's right. You would never think about the second constraint of you know, the AI industry is energy because the amount of energy that it takes to train a model is immense. Um, there and Yeah, go ahead. will go down at 10 cents. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot use solar. Uh, wind energy is not, is not reliable either because what if it's a calm day and it's evening, right? So they have to use you know, uh, fossil fuels. They have to use fuels to generate the, the electricity. The energy amount or the energy demand is so high that Google and Facebook, those are the two that I know of, they already have the license to operate as an energy producer. They can become quote unquote PG&E. But they have no interest in selling their energy to you or me because they are going to use up all the energy they can produce. So they will put a power plant right next to a data center so that all the energy produced by the power plant is consumed by the data center. That is how much AI and is how much energy is needed by the AI, uh, the uh, GAI, the Gen AI industry. It is crazy, okay? But what does that have anything to do with you being a software engineer? If you can think of a clever way to perform the compu computation in hardware that is energy saving, you'll be super valuable to this entire industry. Okay, I just want to kind of keep that in a context so that you guys can kind of relate what we are learning in this class. I mean, this is a long trajectory. I'm not saying that in two years you'll be the top-notch, you know, engineer who can design chips. You know, and people will be paying you like five thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars a year, because you'll be worth that much easily if you can improve the efficiency. It will take you time to ramp up to you know, to that kind of position, but that. Those positions never um, were never really this important in the past. 
people were happy with, oh, we just got AMD processors, we got Intel processors, we got, um, uh, what is the processor on Raspberry Pis? The ARM processors, right? The ARM processors, um, I mean, Apple is great, you know, they have the M2 and all their, their own chips, but those are all conventional processors. It, it's all changing because of the AI industry. My, my watch just beeped me, so it's time to take roll. So let's go take roll first, and then we'll kind of dive right back into the actual technical content of this class. You cannot see the roll taking activity just yet because I have not released it. So that is here. Let me unhide it. And go there just so they can see the access code. And not surprisingly, the access code is just NAND, N-A-N-D. You have until 9.45 you know, to uh, get this activity done. Plenty of time. Computer engineer Computer engineering used to be kind of like a second class citizen, you know, because everybody wants to be get into computer science, okay? And then those who cannot get into computer science goes like, oh, okay, fine, I'm gonna get into computer engineering. I think that trend is gonna reverse. But how much time is gonna take to really reverse to impact you, you know, when you're trying to transfer? That I do not know. Right, so I think most people are done with this row taking activity. The passcode is still up here, but I'm gonna continue with the discussion here. This is just a prelude of the new module. So I'm gonna go into the new module, which is about how do we represent values. All right, so I'm gonna go to the slide just so that you guys know where to find that slide. It is all the way down here. It's about values, numbers, and bases. I'll open up in a new tab. I will probably not get, back to, get back to the slide for a while because I'm gonna talk about certain things that you will say, we know that already. I've been knowing this since elementary school. And then I'll make a twist. You go like, oh, okay. Did not see that coming. Let me get to my notepad here. All right, so I'm gonna, in the, in the other class I was using handwriting, you know, but I think I can also make a view with just a notepad. So I'm gonna start with um, a specific number in base 10, something that you are ultimately very, very familiar with, okay? So I'm gonna pick, uh, let's say 17 point um, three, two, five, okay? And it's in, it's in base 10. Well, do you know what is the value being represented? I think that's a stupid question to ask in this class, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to expand it, okay? And you know, you guys will go like, oh, okay, am I in the wrong class? Okay, because I will just say that this is 10 plus seven plus point three plus 0 0.02 plus 0 0.005. Now, is that really necessary? Well, kind of questionable at this point, but is it wrong? Nope, it's not wrong. I mean, this is exactly how we interpret a number. Okay, so I'm gonna take this one step further. I'm gonna say this is one times 10 plus seven times one plus three times 0 0.1, whoops, plus two times 0 0.01 plus five times point, oops, point zero zero 0.001. Is that okay? But are you starting to notice a pattern? Because computer programming and a lot of your know, computer science your stuff is all about noticing patterns. But if you, so if you're starting to notice a pattern, good. Okay, because that means you're already going like, I, I think I kind of know where this is heading, okay, which is good. 
This is the kind of stuff you can put in your notes. Okay, so if you're taking notes, you can put your own thoughts into your notes. Okay, because that's something that is not being recorded by you know, the recording. The recording is only recording what I'm saying and also what is on the projector. Your own thoughts sometimes is just as valuable in your notes. All right, so let's go ahead and expand this one more time. So this is becoming one times 10 to the power of one. Of course, 10 is 10 to the power of one. You know, what is the value of this? Why are we doing this, right? And I'm gonna change the format just a little bit because I want to use this format here. Seven times 10 to the power of zero because one is 10 to the power of zero. In your mind, if you're already thinking, oh, okay, I know, I know what's gonna happen next, okay? Because you know, they are all powers of 10, okay? It's just that you know, they're all going down in terms of the exponent. Then you're absolutely correct. But I'm gonna write it anyway, just so that you know, we, have a, we have something to talk about on the projector, okay? And then we have two times 10 to the power of negative two. And then finally, we have five times 10 to the power of negative three. We good, are we doing okay so far? The math of this part is crazy. You guys know all of this already, okay? There's nothing new about the math. The pattern, on the other hand, is really where the importance is. Because this is what a number is. A number, like 17.235, is a way to represent a value. But what is the value of the number? Each digit of a number, based on its position, is indicating the quantity of a power of the base, a particular power of the base. Okay, I, I know you guys know every single word that I just said, but do you want me to repeat that sentence? Okay, the value represented by a number is the summation of the uh, each digit multiplied by a power of the base based on the position of the digit. Okay, so in this particular example, this is digit zero. Now why do I call seven the digit zero? Because it is indicating the quantity of base to the power of zero. What base are we talking about? Didn't I mention earlier that this is a base 10 number? So my base is 10. Are we doing okay so far with that? So I have one of 10 to the power of one. I have seven to the power of, seven of 10 to the power of zero. I have three of 10 to the power of negative one. I have two of 10 to the power of negative two, and so on. That is how we uh, come up with the actual value represented by a number. And a number always need to basically either implicitly or explicitly state the base. Since we're all taught base 10, you know, from elementary school, that is implied. Do we have to use base 10? Can we use other bases? And if we decide to use other bases, you know, how, how is that gonna work? So I'm gonna throw a very odd base, you know, as an example. So let's take a look at, I'm just randomly picking a number here, 234, okay? Don't tell me this is 234 because it is a base seven number. Of all the base, I decide to choose a prime number that is not two. Two is two kind of makes sense, okay? But seven, why seven? I'll explain that later. Okay, so now the question is, what is the value represented by two, three, four, but in base seven? How do we reapply the structure that we saw earlier and just go like, oh, okay, we just have to change that one thing and then we can come up with the actual value. So can someone tell me how you would do it? Okay, so instead of using thinking in symbolic terms or thinking in you know, expressions and equations, think about what I said. 
each digit of a number indicates the quantity of a particular power of the base based on the position of the digit. Okay, do you guys vaguely, vaguely remember that's what I said a little earlier? Okay, so you think about this two, okay? And you ask, okay, so the two is indicating the quantity of a particular power of seven because it is, it's a base seven number. So the question is seven to the power of what? Hmm? Two. two, that is correct. Because the four is digit zero, the three is digit one, the two is digit two. Being digit two, it is responsible to indicate the quantity of seven to the power of two, or seven squared, okay? So if I need to write this out, it becomes two times seven to the power of two, plus three times seven to the power of one, plus four times seven to the power of zero. Now, if I wanted to, I could make this a decimal number with decimal places, but you know, um, you know so something is divided by seven is not very nice to represent in base 10, so I try not to do that. <coughs> so now, we just have to look at this and go like, oh, okay, I know what is seven squared, it is 49, and then this is just three times seven itself, and that's just four, because you know, seven to the power zero is just one. And then you just perform the multiplication, add them together, so 2 times 49 is 98, so we have 98 plus 21 plus 4, and that would be um, 119 plus 4, 123, I think, in base 10. That is completely coincidental that the base 7 number 234 turns out to be 123 in base 10. Completely, completely coincidental. What are the chances, right? Sometimes it just happens. Okay, but do we have any questions about this example? You can use any base. Doesn't have to be base 10. The, the, the fact that we are using base 10 and we think everything is in base 10 is a typical example of a thinking box that was put onto our mind from early on. Because in elementary school, they only tell you about base 10. And it turns out base 10 is actually a very poor base to, to, to use because how long did it take you to memorize the multiplication table? If you have younger siblings or kids, you know, or you know, your neighbor has kids, you're learning the multiplication table, you can ask them. You can see the frustration in their eyes because you know, it is not easy to memorize. It's a pretty big table. In base two, okay, we'll get to that point. The multiplication table in base two is like, oh, is that it? Five minutes, you're done. <laughs> How long did it take you to remember, to understand uh, you know, two minus five is a borrow of one from the next digit um, and a seven as a result? That takes a while too, okay, just to understand that. In base two, it's like, oh, the only exception to the case is zero minus one is a one with a borrow of one. That's it. Because the other three cases are all trivial. One minus one is a zero. Does it really depend on the base? No. One minus zero is a one. Does it really depend on the base? No. Zero minus zero is zero. Does it depend on the base? No. There's only one case you go like, oh, I can't have to think about that. In base 10, there are many cases you, where you have to think about it. Because every time you are, your subtrahend, okay, which is the number that you're subtracting uh, from the other one, is larger than the minimum, which is the number being subtracted, you have to understand borrow. And there are many of those cases. Is that okay? Yes, go ahead. <coughs> for a very specific reason, because when we use the word 100, we have that quantity in our mind. So 200 is not really just saying it's two, uh, followed by two additional digits. We actually know it is two times 10 to the power of two. So when we look at this number, we just say it is two, three, four in base seven. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm just mixing. Yeah, so, uh, I guess what I'm uh, curious about is how, I mean, I, I 
understand the concept of mm-hmm. how to preemptively study for future energy expenditure and stuff. It's two, three, four in base or seven. Two, three, four. I'm so sorry. Is two, three, <laughs> four in base seven mean the same as one hundred and twenty two in base seven? It has to do with this two is representing that there's two of seven shifts. This three is telling us that we have seven of, of excuse me, three of seven to the power of one here. And this four is telling us that we have four of seven to the power of zero in this two. Okay, so so we're really doing even base seven shifts. That's all we're doing is just replacing the base. We are replacing the base. Instead of saying ten to the power of something, now it is seven to the power of something. Okay. The rest is the same. So this is you know this is usually what I teach or the way I teach is I will give you something that is so simple that you will ask why are we talking about this, and then I will start to gradually I will start to turn it into a pattern, okay, and then you guys will follow the conversion into the pattern without any problem because it only involves fairly simple math, and then suddenly I will throw a wrench into the whole thing and go like oh let's change the base from base ten to base seven, and then you go like. Hold on a second here, <laughs> because that's exactly what many of you are thinking. It's like, wait, what is this? Well, it's applying the same pattern again with a different parameter. That's all. Okay? Is that okay? You have been very good at base conversion for a while. So I'm going to ask you a question. Okay? If I go to, you know, if I buy something and the change is, um, I'm going to pick a number here. Uh, seventeen dollars. Mm, yeah, seventeen is a good one. Seventeen dollars and I have to pick a, another good number here for that for this to work. Uh, seventy-two, seventy-two cents. Okay, this is a dollar amount. Okay. So let's just say that you are working at a retail store and you are the person who has to kind of give me this much cash in, ch- you know, as change. Okay. How do you? How do you work this out? How many how many people are just gonna think like this is like, oh the easiest way to do this is to give the customer one thousand seven hundred and seventy two pence. Well that certainly is an easy thing to do. I don't think the client or the customer is gonna appreciate it. <laughs> right? So from your perspective, how did you know that there's a one dollar one ten dollar bill and then a five, two ones and then two quarters, two dimes, and two pennies. How, do you, how did you figure that out? All in your head, without a piece of paper. Because I know you guys did that, okay? I know the moment I wrote this number on the board and I said, oh, okay, make that you know, as change, you already did it in your head, kind of without a piece of paper. Okay, so why is that impressive? I call that impressive. Because in the U.S. currency, okay, if you just look at the most commonly used you know, denomination, we have a dollar, okay, and then on the flip side of a dollar, we ha- okay. Let me kind of scroll down. So let's go to the next one. We don't have a two. We, we do have a two dollar bill, but it's not usually used in circulation. So we just say, okay, the next one practically is a five, and then we have a ten, and then we have a twenty, and then we have a fifty and then a hundred and so on. And then on the other side, you have a quarter, okay? So you know, the next one down is a quarter. Even though we do have half dollars, they're not common at all. And then we have dimes, and then we have nickels, and then we have pennies. In other words, if you have a friend or a relative coming from a European country, and you're trying to teach that person how US currency works, it would take 15 minutes. Because you know, not only do you have to, the other person has to memorize the actual amount of the coins and the bills, they also have names, okay? I know the bills have names too. What is the other name of a $1 bill? It's usually by the president. So who is on the $1 bill? Hmm? I cannot remember, okay? I'm, I'm really poor with remember things, remembering things. So you know, there are common names, you know, this is a penny, this is a nickel, this is a dime, this is a quarter. The quarter is the only one that makes sense. Nothing else. 
is like, oh, okay, I can logically deduce the name of that coin. No, you cannot. You just have to memorize. But that's not even the worst part of it. The worst part of it is the multiplier to get there, okay? So to get to a nickel, you have to times five to the penny. This is a times two to get to a dime. This one is not even an integer, it's 2.5. It takes two and a half dimes to make up a quarter. It's like, what the? This is a times four. So far, I have not seen a repeating pattern. Have you? Then we get a times five again. You guys go like, oh, goody. Okay, this is a times two. So maybe it's a repeating pattern. The next one is two and a half again. Nope, just a two. <laughs> There's no pattern to the whole thing. And then the next one is two and a half. Now we get a two and a half. It's like, what the, you know, it's like, there's, there's no pattern in this whole thing. There's no, there's no system in the entire thing. And yet, you have mastered not only the, 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 the amount of the one the dollar, you have even mastered the conversion in your head, okay? $17.72 is one $10 bill, one five, two twos, two quarters, no dime, no nickel, and two pennies. It's like, how did that happen? because you practice a lot, that's all, okay? But knowing this, let me present this, okay? You know, if, if Tech was a politician, he would make very strange policies that you know, most people in either party would go like, what the, what is he talking about, okay? Because it's not about politics, it is about making things more elegant and work better. So if I were a politician, I would propose that we have a $1 bill. The next one is gonna be a $2 bill. The next one's gonna be a $4 bill. And I know you guys are looking, seeing the pattern already. You're thinking, oh, eight, 16, and so on. You'll be correct. So we have $8 bills, $16 bills, and so on. And then on the flip side, we're gonna have half dollar you know, coins. We have you know, quarter, dollar, quarter, quarter dollar coins and maybe a one-eighth of a dollar you know, coin. I don't know, I mean, you know, it's just speculative, right? I would propose that we change our currency into something like this. We go like, how am I gonna figure out you know, the, the change you know, it, with this in place? So let me give you an example. The, the other example is not a very good one because you know, to represent 7-2 is not easy. So let's, let's work with this, okay? This is the amount, and these are the available uh, denominations, okay? How do you figure this out? Just one, one, two, three, technically 10. Mm, close, yeah. that, would, that would work, but it's not the optimal. If I want to use the least number of coins and bills, you know, use a 16, then you have 1.325 left, right? So we don't have an eight, we don't have a four, we don't have a two, we have a one. Then you have 0.325 left. We won't have a half, but we're gonna use a quarter. Then we use the eight. Is that okay? So let me just write it down, okay? So in this case, I'm gonna have, um, so I'm gonna use the, okay, let me, let me put it in, in the position first. So we need one of these. But once I take care of the 16, I don't need an eight, I don't need a four, I don't need a two, I need a one to make up for the $17. $17. I don't need a half, okay? But I do need a quarter as well as an eighth. Does that make sense? Okay. Does it take you as quickly as it took you know, with the US currency? Probably not as quick, okay? Maybe just a little bit longer because it's new to you. But the approach is very systematic. You start with the largest denomination and then you work your way to the smaller ones. But the nice thing about this is either you have one or none. There's no division involved. You only have to say, is the leftover amount greater than or equal to a denomination? If it is, one of them. If it is not, zero of them. Is that okay? Yep, go ahead. Um, the one two bar plus one plus the one two bar, is that point eight of a cent? You are correct. 
I messed up. <laughs> that is my mess up year. It has supposed to be a seven. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. All right. Sometimes my arithmetic is off. So, but the point stands. Okay. You know, I'll, you know, if I give you this amount, you know, made a mistake. So it's three seven five and another three two five. But the approach is the same. Okay. So you look at this number here, you go like, oh, it's all zeros and ones. Looks like a binary number. Because bi a binary number is a base two number. It can only have zeros and ones, not two itself. Just like with a base 10 number, there's not a single digit representing the quantity of 10 itself. Is that OK? Because we got digits from zero to nine. We don't have a single digit to represent the quantity of 10 because 10 is represented as one zero in base 10. So in base two, we can only have two digits, zero and one. That looks like a binary number to me. So the question is, as a binary number, how do we write this binary number? It is one starting with the most significant digit, which is this one here, zero, 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 one. And then I put a point here and then zero, one, one. So you guys go like, okay, so what is the purpose of the point? In other words, pun intended, what is the point of the point? The point of the point is to help you locate digit zero. Digit zero is the digit that is immediately to the left-hand side of the point. It's just a GPS locate, it's a geotag and say, this is digit zero. Because once you find digit zero, you can find digit one, digit two on the left-hand side. You can find digit negative one, digit negative two on the right-hand side. So all you need to do is to find digit zero. And that is what the point is in a decimal number. Are we doing okay so far with all this discussion? All right, cool. Um, let me just emphasize that this is a base two number. So using just a regular text editor, if I put parentheses with a number next to a number, that is telling you that this is a base two number. Is that okay? It's a convention, okay? It, this is a convention. If I'm using your text um, format get text, the two would be a subscript. So a subscript two does the same thing as two in parentheses indicating that it is a binary number. Alrighty. Are there any questions? Yes? Why is it different than base 64? Huh? Why is it different than base 64? Why? It is a base of 2 because what is the other way to say um, um, excuse me 0.125. It is 2 to the power of negative 3. Um, oh, okay. I just uh, messed up my. Okay. I'm, I'm leaving enough space to so I can insert the power of 2 here. What about the 2.25? It is 2 to the power of negative 2. This one, okay. I think you guys know the pattern already. This is 2 to the power of. 0, this is 2 to the power of 1, 2 to the power of 2, 2 to the power of 3, and 2 to the power of 4. That is why this is a binary number, because each digit on the right-hand side is indicating a either the presence or the absence of a power of 2. So, so 2 is the base in this case. I'm, I was very implicit about you know, two being the base, but when you start to look at the denomination, all being powers of two, then you go like, oh, so that's one way to look at a binary number, is to imagine that you only have denomination that are powers of two. And you have to figure out the presence or the absence of a power of two to make up a particular quantity that you need. Is that okay so far? Okay, I'm going to give you guys another chance to ask questions because I think there might be questions among you. you know, some, yeah, go ahead. Um, so with like the, the base 10 numbers, 
Uh-huh. It was pretty much like, for, you know, it's like the base level number. It was like, um, if you go over three to the left, that was like, so like we have two, three, four. Mm-hmm. Um, we went over three to the left and then two to the, and two times seven to the power of three is also to the power of zero. Nope, to the power of two because we start with, because we start with to the power of zero. It is the same, even though, but in this case, you know, because I do have, you know, half, so that's, so that's why, you know, in, mm, right here, this digit here indicates the quantity of 2 to the power of 0, because it's the digit that is immediately to the left-hand side of the point, and th that's the whole purpose of the point, is to tell you where can I find the digit 2. And of course, Europeans will disagree because they use a comma when Americans use a, des a period and they would use a period when we use a comma. So are we, is that okay? All right. So this kind of math looks easy because you know, when you gotta break it down, it's all easy. But you know, when you look at this as a pattern, it goes like, okay, so how do we express this pattern? Because now that we understand that, oh, so a number is no more than just a representation of a value, and the way we represent a value is to give us a bunch of digits, and each digit you know, is indicating the quantity of a particular power of whatever base we choose to use. That's the sum of it. So now the question is, can we generalize this into some kind of a mathematical equation? So that means, you know, in, okay, I'm going to pick this as an example. So in this particular example, I'm going to say, you know, 4 is digit 0, because, you know, that's the position. 3 is digit 1, and the 2 is digit 2. I'm starting to abstract these things, okay? I'm assigning a particular name to each and every digit, and using, you know, 0, one, two, after the E, they're typically subscripts, but I can't type subscript on a, on a text editor. So they are based, this is the way I indicate the digit position. Position zero, position one, position two, on the other side we have position negative one and so on. So now, with this explained, I'm gonna get into the slide itself where there is a formula. Okay, so this is all the stuff that we have talked about already. So in terms of base 10, okay, this is, this is an example of another base 10 number. So in terms of a base 10 number, um, the value being represented by base 10 number is the sigma or the summation of the individual digit times 10 to the power of the position of the digit, which is i. So I'm gonna pause here and make sure that everybody understands what this, is, what this sigma notation is trying to tell you. So are we familiar with the sigma notation? We good on, we good here? Questions? No. Kinda? Okay. So if the answer is kinda, I can kind of further explain what is a sigma notation. Um, I will attempt to set up my tablet to do this. And I forgot to bring my tablet, so I can't. I'll do it on the whiteboard, but this part is not recorded as a result, okay? So the, the use of the sigma notation would have um, four components, okay? So there's the index variable, there is the um, starting point, which I call this B for beginning, this is the end, which is you know, the, so B, e, B and E defines the range of typically integers that you're gonna uh, go through. And then there's some kind of you know, expression here. I'm just gonna call this f of i. So this expression potentially depends on i. So f of i is just a function that returns either a real number or an integer or whatnot, okay? So this thing, if you are to do this, so let's say you know, the sum is defined to be this. If you were to do this using a loop, then the way it works is gonna be a for loop. 
you initialize the sum to zero to begin with. You also initialize i to d. To stay in the loop, i has to be less than or equal to e because when i equals to e, that is your last iteration. So it's a less than or equal to and not just a less than. And then after each iteration, you implement the index variable i. So this sets up the condition of the loop itself. And then for each iteration in the loop, all we do is to add f of i to the sum. So that's you know, kind of the, I mean, if you like curly braces, fine. It is not necessary in this case. Yep? Why did we go from the 10th list to the 10th bit? Say again? Uh, it goes from like the, the 1 to the 10th, and then it jumps down to the 10th place. Well, the ordering is not important, you know, because you know, I'm just illustrating that you know, there are negative positions as well as positive you know, positions. Because otherwise, I can't really easily illu illustrate that it can go on to both directions. So are we good with the sigma notation? You know, how the, this sigma notation in math really is the same thing as this you know, uh, loop in C or C++. So we good? Okay, excellent. Very good. So are we all going like, okay, this looks a little weird because there's infinity, negative infinity, and positive infinity. But otherwise, yeah, I kind of get it. It's a digit, and this is the base, and I is the position. So are we, good, are we doing okay with that? Okay. So let's, let me explain why there's the negative infinity and the positive infinity. Because for any number, it can be seen as just a portion of an infinitely long expression. It's just that everybody else are zeros. So everything, okay, let me use this as an example. We have none of the 100s. We have none of the thousands. We have none of the 10,000 and so on. So in your mind, you can just kind of imagine there's an infinite number of zeros all the way out here. What about the other side? We don't have a one of the 10,000s. We don't have a one of the 100,000s and so on. So you can kind of imagine that we just have zeros all the way you know, after the five to infinity. That is why I use you know, negative infinity to positive infinity here, because I don't know ahead of time how many of those digits are non-zero. Is that okay? All right. So once we have this, then the next question is, what if I want to deal with a particular base B? Well, that's not difficult. Just replace the 10 with the base that you have chosen, and we're done. Okay. So if you're starting to notice that you know, I go from Conti, extract a pattern out of the Conti, and then use symbolic ways to express the abstracted pattern, and then we apply the abstracted pattern to a specific example. That is the way I teach in most of my programming classes. Because I want to start with I want to start with things that you're familiar with, and then help you discover the pattern within things that you're already familiar with. And then we come up with an abstract way to describe that pattern. But once you have an abstract way to describe the pattern you can then easily reapply the abstract pattern to things that are concrete. So if I give you a base three number, can you figure out the value of the base three number? Easy peasy, okay? Because you just have to say, okay, give me all the digits as E of I, three is B, and I'll just make, I'll just do the summation here. So it wouldn't be difficult to do that. Is that okay so far? All right. So there's one more thing, there's one more equation here. So this one is good for figuring out the actual value of a number of a particular base. The other one is over here, okay? There's a lot of, little bit of description up there, but this is the other one that is important. This is not a typo. This is intended to be kind of like an angle, a, a square bracket, but without a top. This is called a floor function. The floor function returns, okay, so you know, this is the definition. The floor function returns the largest integer 
that is less than or equal to whatever is inside the square notation, the, 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 the floor notation. Okay, that's, that's a mouthful to say, okay? So let me give you a few examples and you guys can tell me what it is. What do you say is the floor of 2.2? Two two. Okay, good, very good. What is the floor of 2.7? Two two. Uh, okay, so don't try to interpret the word floor, apply the definition. What is the largest integer that is less than or equal to 2.7? It's two, not three. We are not rounding, okay? So this is also two. So we're gonna throw in some tricky cases here, okay? What is the floor of negative point two? Very good, it is negative one, it is not zero. In other words, we're not truncating either. If we were truncating, then the truncation of 0 0.2 would have been zero because we're just dropping the fractional part. But we are not dropping the fractional part. We are looking at, we are looking for the largest integer that is less than the quantity that we are taking the floor of. So the largest integer that is less than or equal to negative 0.2 is negative one. All right? All right, so now that we know what uh, the floor you know, uh, operator means, this equation allows you to start with a particular value. Given a particular base, it will give you a particular digit at position i. All right? So when you look at this, what are you gonna do? You're just gonna say, well, my good tech said so, it has to be the case. I, I'm okay, I just have to memorize this. That is not how I want you guys to think, okay? I want you guys to treat me as if I want to trick you or lie to you all the time. So you have to go like, okay, wait, how can I double check this? Can we double check this? In other words, if I'm gonna say to you like, um, yeah, we, we don't know how much we can rely on tech. So can, do we, have we learned enough in today's class, in this particular lecture, to at least verify this with concrete examples? Okay, the answer is yes. Okay, so how do we do this? If you were watching this on the, in the video, the first thing to do is to rewind it a little bit. Because we did some conversion already. We can use those conversion that we did earlier to at least go like, okay, is this at least consistent with the conversion that we did earlier? We've got a few examples already. So what we'll do, what I'm gonna do, is to say, okay, if I was tax student, I cannot trust tech because you know, he, he messed up you know, the 0.375 to 0.325, right? I mean, that's, a, that's a solid evidence that you cannot trust me. Even though I have no intention of deceiving you, it's just an honest error. So now you go like, okay, how, how do we check this thing out, okay? Well, by the way, here is the base two representation of this actual value. Why don't we use this as an, as an example? Why don't we try to use this to confirm that we are supposed to see a one over here? Okay, so let me pause. Does everybody understand what I'm about to do? I want to use the equation that we see here to double check to apply that equation to this value v base two, so that we can confirm digit negative two is supposed to be one. Does everybody understand what I'm trying to do? Okay, now does that mean that your know, tech is absolutely right? No, it just means it's consistent, okay? You know, just having one example being consistent does not mean it is correct all the time. So now we will define V is the quantity, which is 17.375. You know, the position of the digit I need to figure out is negative two, and the base is two. Is that okay? So I'm filling in all the unknown of this equation. The rest is just plugging in everything and going through the calculation. So we'll go ahead and do that. So according to this part here, the calculation is based on taking the floor of 17.375 divided by 
2 to the power of negative 2, take the result of the floor, and then mod that with 2, because 2 is the base. So is that OK? Does everybody understand how I derived this rather E-like expression? So now we, I just have to go ahead and evaluate. OK. So the que first question is, what is 17.375? OK, there's a, this is a typo. It's supposed to be 375. Uh, divided by 2 to the power of negative 2. In other words, I'm asking how many quarters do we have in 17.375. Uh, the 17 alone is going to give us 17 times 4, which is 68. So we have 68, and then the other one gives me 1. So we have 69 point something. Okay, so this is the floor of 69 point blah, blah, blah. The blah, blah, blah does not really matter. All I need to know is it's at least 69 and not 70. So we are looking at this mod 2. What is the floor of 69 point something? I don't even know what that something is. 69, right? Yep, OK. So, so now we are looking at 69 mod 2. 69 mod 2 is the remainder of 69 divided by 2. I know you guys can figure this one out. Yeah. Yes. All right, cool. That is consistent with this one over here. Is that okay? Let's, let's try the base seven number, okay? So the base seven number is up here. I claim that you know, the quantity, the value known as 123 to us, has, is, can be represented as 234 in base seven. So now I set up my unknown again. The value is 123. The base is 7. And I want to confirm just the 3 of 234. So which digit position are we talking about? 1. That is correct. So i is 1. All right. The rest is just plug in these into here, go through the calculation, and make sure that your result is a 3. I'll do it with you guys, okay? So now we are looking at, um, so the question is, does three equal to, like I'm gonna use this to say, does it equal to the floor of uh, 123 divided by seven to the power of one, and then take the result of the floor and then mod it with seven, which is our base. All right, so this one is indeed uh, 100 and 123 divided by 7 is a 1, 7, so it's 17 point something. Okay, thank you. So it's 17 point something. Okay, what that something is really does not matter. So now we go like, okay, what is the floor of 17 point something? It's just 17. So now we have 17 mod 7 which is the remainder of 17 divided by 7. 17 divided by 7 is 2 with a remainder of 3. Cool. It all works out. So this is an important skill for you guys to develop. If, if the lecture material makes a point, this equals that, OK? People are like, are you really sure? Do, have I learned enough material to verify it? Or at least check for consistency. So now you go back to some of the material that you have learned already, examples perhaps, okay? And then you apply that and go like, okay, maybe I can use that to show that at least this equation is consistent with things that we've already worked out. Being able to notice opportunities to practice what you have learned is a very essential skill. Now, does it happen overnight? Nope. It does not happen overnight. You have to train yourself to think in this way, okay? But it is a useful skill to have because it, this is also critical thinking because critical thinking is basically questioning everything, okay? But it's more than just questioning everything because you're not just questioning and then you're asking the next person to go like, okay, so is this actually right? Did Chuck make a mistake here? You're not asking another person, you're asking yourself. And you're trying to use what you have learned, apply what you have learned already to answer your own question. 
So that, I think, is a very useful thing to develop. It doesn't happen, o happen overnight, okay? I have had 50 plus years of practicing this. But it's just one of the things that I do for no particular reason. It's just the way I prefer to do things. Are we doing okay so far? Did anyone do the uh, MBTI personality test? Okay, some of you did, okay. Uh, I can tell you what I am, okay. I am an INTP. If you read up the description of INTP as a personality type, you will see that, oh yeah, that's definitely that. Uh, by the way, INTP has a high correlation with ADHD. Uh, the other way to say this is INTP and ENTP are overrepresented in people who are diagnosed with ADHD. So sometimes you might notice me going like, wait, Tech just did a quantum jump to something that does not seem to be related to what he just he was just talking about. This happens sometimes. So let me know, you know, if that is happening and go like, okay, Tech, I'm we're we're you're losing us. Okay, and I will try to make that connection. All right. So we are out of time for the lecture. Yes. is Zippy 2 of the base set of representation. All right, so I'm done with the lecture. I'm gonna stop the recorder unless somebody has a question related to the material. Nope, okay, yes, go ahead. to do the calculation for base 10. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's why I use the base 10 representation for D, because we already know how to do the base 10 division and division and so on. Not that you cannot do it in base 6 or base 16 and so on, it's just it doesn't come natural to us. All right, very cool. So reading assignment, okay, because you know, we are not gonna see each other until next Tuesday. So you have, what, five days in between. This is why I don't like, you know, the two-day, you know, week kind of schedule. I like, I really personally prefer Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes because, you know, that means, you know, you only got like two days in between the Friday and the Monday class, which to me helps a lot. You know, to people with ADHD, that structure helps and works a lot better. But since we do not have a choice, I'm gonna have to tell you, finish reading your values, numbers, and bases and continue to read, um, well, this is a, I'm debating whether to talk about binary number addition because it, let's change the sequencing of the material and we'll go to signed versus unsigned integer representation. I'm gonna take these out. The reason why I'm taking these out, I mean, if you guys want to get back to it, if you think, oh, I, but that's a really cool module for me to read, I'll put it back in, but then I'll put you know, in parentheses optional. But for your reading assignment, I just want you guys to continue to read to uh, signed versus unsigned representation, okay? The reason why I'm taking out binary addition and binary subtraction is that topic alone will take about two weeks. And I usually run out of time to talk about actual um, writing C code in assembly code, you know, which is kind of what this class should also talk about. So I'm gonna save some time by not getting into that uh, you know, addition and subtraction thing, and we'll just go straight to the, uh, the signed versus unsigned representation. All right.
Right. So you got your um, reading assignment, and I'm going to unlock the lab for today. The lab of today depends on what you did on Tuesday. So that can be that can present a problem to some people who did not get the the thing worked out on Tuesday. So what I'll do, the rest of you can just go ahead. Okay. If you got a full score for your home for your lab on Tuesday, you can reuse that file, you can download your own file back from Canvas and use that file as a starting point for the lab today. For those of you who did not get that part working, I'll give you my solution to the uh, lab on Tuesday. So I'm gonna put it into the announcement. So this way, you know, if you want to, you can just download that one and use it as a starting point. Right, so let me go find my solution. If I cannot find it, I'm just gonna have to make it. 